Pokemon distributions are a very common thing in the Pokemon franchise. Nowadays they are mostly distributed over Wi-Fi or a code. But back in the day you had to bring your game to the place where the distribution was held and receive the Pokemon like that. The Pokemon you get from these events are usually wow. special in some way. Sometimes they are legendary or mythical Pokemon and other times they are Pokemon that have a special move. But what's unfortunate is that these event Pokemon are only available for a short period of time. So if you simply miss the event, you can never get them again. Until today. My friend Undead Reality and I have once again set out to recreate all these Pokemon distributions that were held around the world. A few of these distribution ROMs and many of these event Pokemon have been preserved and even have a generation method reversed. So with all that information, we decided to recreate all these distributions for the GBA games. Let's get started. Let's first take a look at the ROMs that were preserved. In total there are 4 of them. Aura Mew, Dual Deoxys, Berry Fix Zigzagoon and the Top 10 Pokemon distribution. To use these ROMs you need an English copy of one of the Gen 3 games, a flash card to put the distribution ROM onto and a link cable for the GBA. When connecting the link cable we need to make sure that the smaller purple side goes into the GBA with the distribution ROM, otherwise it is not possible to send over the multiboot. The next step is to boot the GBA with the Gen 3 game in multiboot mode. To do that you need to hold the start and select button when booting up and this will make the Nintendo logo disappear. And with that it is now possible to send over the distributions. Aura and Duel will start the process automatically when the other Game Boy is in multiboot mode. With Berifix Zixikun we have to send it over manually by pressing the A button and with Top 10 we can choose what Pokemon we want to distribute. Out of these Berifix Zixikun is a bit of an outlier here. It is visually very different from the rest and has the capability of updating Ruby and Sapphire to fix the berry glitch. All other distributions looks to be based off the same multiboot, so we will use one of them as a base going forward. Our Ramil was the first one we started working on, so we decided to work from that as a base. And in the end, this was one of the best ones to use, but we'll talk more about that later. Now at this point you might think, what the heck is a multiboot? Well, a multiboot is a different way of loading a game into a GBA, but it is loaded over the link cable instead of the cartridge. This is also how multiplayer works with only one cartridge, but it can also be used for Pokemon distributions. The multiboot still has access to the save file when the cartridge is inserted, so it reads out the save file, writes the Pokemon to it and finishes the distribution. Now that we have a basic understanding of how these four distributions work, let's try to modify something. Um, we will need to know a bit more about these bytes to get started. As you may remember from the mystery gift video, these bytes represent machine code that can be converted into assembly. This will make it all more readable and easier to modify for us. We won't go into detail again about the conversion process, but instead let's dive right back into trying to modify something. What we want to modify is the multi-boot inside the ROM, but we will first have to find it. We know that the multi-boot is sent over the link cable, so by cross-referencing the bytes sent over the link cable and the bytes in the ROM, we can find the multi-boot that is sent over. When we extract this and convert it all to assembly again, we only get a little bit of code out of it. Most of this code is confirming back to the ROM that the multi-boot was transferred over successfully, but at the end however there is something interesting. There is a software interrupt function, and these can be used to access system call functions inside the system ROM of the GBA. The parameter here shows what function we're calling, and 11 in this case means decompressing compressed data. So if we want to make any changes to the distribution, we have to decompress the data ourselves first. From the first few bytes of the compressed data, we can see what compression method is used, and how many bytes the uncompressed data is in total. With that information, we can decompress the distribution and finally have the code that we want to modify. Now that we have the code, let's take a little step back and make a list of all the distributions that we want to recreate. We can sort them all into three different categories. English, Japanese and GameCube distributions. We will first focus on the English distributions. Four of them have already been preserved, so that still leaves eight distributions left to recreate. But for now we will skip Mystery Mew and PCNY because they were distributed very differently. So we'll come back to those later in the video. Right now our first recreation will be the 10th anniversary Celebi distribution. Let's go back to our decompressed code now and try to recreate this. We're gonna start to try and modify something easy, 
the name of the Pokemon. Using the character tables from the Gen 3 games, we found the name of Mew in the distribution and changed it up a little. Now let's try it out and see if it works. Oh, it doesn't. So instead of our boy Wham, we got a cool error 5 message saying that the game couldn't receive the Pokemon properly. So for some reason after changing only a little bit, it refuses to send over the Pokemon now. At this point it is likely to assume that there is a checksum over the entire multiboot. And here I thought we did most things already. So how will we find this checksum? Well, when scrolling through the ROM I found lots of text that is used in the multiboot. This includes the error codes. We can now follow this pointer of the text and make our way back to the code of the checksum. When analyzing the checksum code we can figure out how it all works. All of the bytes in the ROM are added together and then checked if it matches the pre-calculated value that is already in the multiboot. If it matches, it continues the distribution, but if not you are greeted with this fun error 5 code. So if we want to make it work, we have to update the expected checksum after changing the code. And this then allows us to make modifications to the distribution. Now that we have successfully transferred over our boy Wem, we can continue finding other values that we need to change for our Celebi event. And after some trial and error, we mapped out almost everything. But that also brings us to our first issue. Mew here only has two moves, and the Celebi we want to recreate has four. We can add more moves, but if we do, we start to override the name of the Pokemon. Luckily for us, this little Pokemon structure here has a separate pointer towards the name that makes it easy to modify for us, allowing us to now create a Pokemon with four moves. At this point, you might think that we're done. But there's one more issue left for us to solve. Every Mew needs to have the obedience flag set. But for Celebi and every other Pokemon it needs to be disabled. There's absolutely no indication of it being in our little Pokemon structure that we found. So how is this variable set? Well something that became clear as we worked on the multiboots is that the distribution has a lot of code that is also in the game itself. One of these things is how the different parameters of the Pokemon are set. You see, each parameter has its own index, and this means that the obedience flag has its own index as well. By searching for this index, we found where the flag was set, and we could disable it, allowing us to recreate the Celebi event fully. Well, almost. To really make it perfect, we have to find a way to swap out the sprite of the Pokemon. As you may remember, the graphics are made out of little 8x8 cubes, and each cube has a total of 64 pixels but you only need 32 bytes to create a cube. This is because the graphic works with a palette with a maximum of 16 colors. Each 4 bits of the graphic then represents an index of that palette. This all combined is enough information to insert a new graphic into the multiboot. The problem is however that we didn't have that information while working on it, which resulted in some pretty interesting results. With the new graphics in the multiboot, we have now created the perfect recreation of the 10th anniversary Celebi event. Next up is Space Center Deoxys. After Celebi this was very easy to recreate, but one thing we have to keep into account is the experience. The experience of the Pokemon is set based on the level and the experience group that we're into. In total there are 6 different experience groups. For Celebi we could just reuse Mew's experience group, because they share the same one. But if we want to recreate the axis, we have to choose the slow experience group. The distribution has a lookup table for all experience groups for each level. So we just have to make sure that we set the correct group and level and it will set the experience accordingly. Next up are the top 20 events. It's very similar to top 10, even sharing some of those Pokemon with only a few minor differences. The recreation of these Pokemon went again very smoothly, except for one. Alakazam can have two different abilities. And at first we only got one ability out of it, making 50% of the ones we got illegal. So we decided to find the code where the ability is supposed to be set, and found a flag that we can enable for the Pokemon that have two abilities. It will then use the first bit of the personality value to choose the ability that it will get. And this will now make all Alakazams legal. We're getting close now to finishing all the English events. Next up is Rock's Matang. There were two big differences from Rock's Matang and the others. One is that the gender of the original trainer can only be male, and the other thing is that it needs to get the national ribbon. Giving it only the male trainer wasn't that difficult to figure out. Normally it uses a randomized function to randomly give out the gender of the original trainer, 
but for Matang we simply have to turn it off, just like how we did with the obedience flag earlier. Next is the national ribbon. We decided to reuse the obedience flag. Remember, each parameter has a specific index. So what we need to do is re-enable the code for the obedience flag and change the index for it to be the national ribbon. And by doing that it will give us a perfect recreation of Rox Matan. Lastly for now on the English list we have Wishmaker Jirachi. There are once again two difficulties with this distribution. One is that it randomly either holds the Salak Berry or the Ganlon Berry. The other is that this Pokemon has the ability to be shiny. All the other distributions so far had code that prevents them from being shiny. So we need to find this anti-shiny code and disable it. Let's start with that. The shininess of a Pokemon is determined by the trainer ID and the personality value of the Pokemon. The trainer ID doesn't change, so normally it generates a personality value and checks if the Pokemon is shiny or not. If it is shiny, it will generate a new value until it is not shiny. For our Jiraji, we simply have to disable this check at the end and just let it use the first personality value that it generates. Next up is the berry. We need to add code to randomly give a berry to Jiraji. The event in the past used the specific generation method for this, and to faithfully recreate this, we have to add some custom code. We first have to create some space to add the custom code. To do this, we deleted the other language's error codes that asked to insert that language game. We then used the place where we disabled the obedience flag to jump towards the empty spot that we now created. Now we can add our custom code here. The first thing we have to do is make two RNG calls. The event Pokemon are all generated in a specific way, and this Jiraji uses the sixth call to generate the item. If we look at this formula, then we have to take this RNG call and divide it by 3. Then the first bit of that result determines which berry you get. If it is 0, then you get a Salak berry, and if it's 1, you get the Ganlon berry. And lastly, we give this item to the Pokemon and return to our normal code. When we now distribute the Jiraji we made, we see that it comes with a berry from our custom code. And with that we finished all the English distributions that we wanted to work on. I want to thank you all for watching and I'll see you in the next one. I'm kidding, this is not the end. We did mention that we would do all distributions. Let's continue to the Japanese distributions. We now recreated all the easy English distributions. We were already really happy with our results, but we quickly realized we want to recreate all of them. So now let's start working on the Japanese ones. The first step is transforming the ROM to accept the Japanese games and add correct translations for all the messages. My friend Undead Reality will tell you more about the process of this. The easiest part was enabling the Aura software to accept the Japanese games. In total there was four different game checks. One for Ruby and Sapphire, one for Emerald, one for Fire Red, and one for Leaf Green. The first thing we had to do was swap out all the supported game codes with the Japanese game codes. Doing so enables the software to detect the Japanese games only. From there we deleted the Spanish, French, German, and Italian messages from the ROM. Once that's done, we have a Japanese only distribution ROM, except we still need to change the English messages to Japanese. This is where it gets tricky. When we first started, we didn't know where the symbols were or how to access them. So I took a huge chunk of text and brute forced results by sequentially ordering the hex codes until they started to appear. Great, they're still in the software. However, there's still one more character we're looking for. We could have changed the messages of course, however through pictures and videos that were preserved on the internet, we can clearly see that this character was included in the text. If it's not in the software, how do we access it? We have to make it. We initially thought that we could just implement our own custom character and call it a day. However, we suddenly noticed it would become distorted, enlarged, cropped out, or non-existent in some instances. This is because each character has to fit within a specified size. Anything under the size limit is fine, but anything too big will cause an issue. After a lot of revisions, we agreed on the final version of the kanji. I'm personally proud how it turned out. Finally, we have all the resources needed to implement the Japanese messages. After looking through software like the Japanese Negaiboshi Jirachi Multiboot and consulting a few people who speak Japanese, we were able to make translations for all the messages in the software. With that, our conversion from a multi-language distribution ROM to a Japanese-only ROM is complete. Back to you, Gopier. It's about time now we tackle these Japanese distributions. As you can see, there are so, so many of them. That means that we will not go over each and every single one of them. Most of them are just doing what we did before. So instead we will now focus on the ones that were the most difficult. 
Starting now with one that was arguably the hardest to recreate. It took over 100 different tries to finally get it to work. The hardest Pokemon to recreate was Poke Park Meowth and Pokemon Sunday Wobbuffet. So at this point you might think, why are these difficult? Well, these Pokemon need to hold mail. And just giving the item isn't gonna cut it. To understand why these are difficult, we have to talk a little bit more about how mail works. The mail has two different components to it that are stored in separate places. These are the item and the contents of the mail. The item is simply given to the Pokemon and is part of the Pokemon structure. But the contents of the mail is placed in its own section in the save file. These two components are then linked together by the use of an index, which is once again part of the Pokemon structure. So if we want to make it work, we have to read out a separate part of the save file where the mail is stored, then find an index where we can write the contents of the mail towards, and lastly give the correct index and item to the Pokemon. These last two things aren't that difficult, and are things we've already been doing with the previous Pokemon, like giving the berry to Jiraji. But reading and writing to the save file is far beyond anything we've done so far. So let's first do a bit more research about the save file and where the mail is exactly stored. We found that the save file is split into 14 different sections and the mail we're looking for is in section number 4. Luckily for us there is also a function in the multiboot that allows us to read out a certain slot of the save file. But the bad news is, is that section number 4 is not always in slot 4. Something we learned when researching the save file is that it rotates every time we save the game. Besides that there are two versions of the save file, which the game also alternates between every save. This is to have a backup in case something goes wrong. So what we now have to do is find section 4 in each save file and use the latest version of it. Now let's take a look at the code that we made. We first looked through all the sections of the save file to find the latest version of sector number 4. Each sector also has a save index, so this will help us to find which of the two is the latest version. Once we found the correct one, we make a copy of it that we can later modify. Next up is finding a spot to write the mill towards. In total there are 15 slots for the mill, but we only have to look at the first 6, because those are reserved for the Pokemon in your party. At the first possible empty index we write our mill here, and afterwards calculate a new checksum for the save sector. And lastly we give the correct item and index of the mill to the Pokemon, and write the save sector back to the save file. Explaining it like this might sound like it wasn't that hard, but writing all of it in assembly and debugging every part of the code took a lot of time. To debug our code we used the item slot of the Pokemon. Like this we knew for example that we actually got the correct sector or the latest save file, or if we could accurately find the correct slot to place our mail into. All of these different steps were very difficult to get it to work and it is so amazing to finally have these two Pokemon in my games. I could honestly talk for a very long time about the creation process of these Pokemon, but we will be here for a very long time if we do. So let's move on to the next event. Next up are the eggs that were released in Japan through Multiboot. There were a couple, but we're only gonna talk about one of them, and that is the Pokemon Center 5th Anniversary event. There are 4 Pokemon you can get from this event, Pichu, Ralts, Absol and Bagon. These Pokemon get a special move when they hatch, and Pichu even has a 5% chance of being shiny. As you can already imagine, this multi-boot distributes more than one Pokemon. So how does this work? Well, let's go over the generation method of this. The first thing that is determined is what Pokemon will be distributed. Each Pokemon has a set weight, and all the weights added together gets us to 1000. To then get a random Pokemon, we generate a random value between 0 and 1000 and keep subtracting the weights until it is no longer possible. The end result is then the Pokemon that will be distributed. Now there are two paths that we can go down on. One is to generate a Pokemon like normal, and the other one is to force Pichu to be shiny. Another thing we have to keep into consideration is that the normal Pokemon cannot be shiny. So we have to add anti-shiny code as well. For both of these things we need the trainer ID from the game that we sent the distribution towards. Because remember these are eggs and will eventually get your trainer ID when they hatch. So what we now have to do is read out the save file again and get the trainer ID from this. But after our adventure with the mill it wasn't that hard to get it. The only hard thing now is to add code to force Pichu to be shiny. And this also has a specific method of course. For all the other Pokemon we use RNG called 3 and 4 for the personality value. But for our shiny Pichu we need to use 4 and 5 for some reason. It is then forced shiny by changing the lower 16 bits of the personality value. 
After all that we simply put the Pokemon in an egg and set all the other variables that need to be set. For this we made our own little structure for each Pokemon that contain all the variables that are needed to create them. And with that it's time to move on to Berryfix Zigzagoon. And at this point you might think, wasn't this one preserved? And you'd be right, the English one was preserved, but the Japanese one isn't. So let's make it. The way Berryfix Zigzagoon was originally generated was based on the RTC and the games. The seconds, minutes and hours were added together to create a random seed for Zigzagoon. Because of this there are only 214 unique Zigzagoons that you could get. For our recreation we won't use the RTC. We will simply take the seed it normally generates and use a modulo operation on it to get a valid seed from it. With this method it is now possible to distribute the Zigzagoon to all games regardless of if the battery works or not. Lastly we need to make sure that it is always shiny. This works the exact same as the shiny Pichu from a while ago, so we can copy our code from that and faithfully recreate this event in the Aura Mew ROM. Now that we have recreated the Japanese version in this way, we decided to recreate the English Zigzagoon as well. Like this it will be a lot more easily accessible. And for the sake of having everything made from our meal, we also recreated the preserved top 10 and dual deoxys distribution in the same way. Now everything is made from our meal. Let's go back to the Japanese distributions. As you can see there is still one left, but we'll come back here at the end of the video to talk about them. First we're gonna take a look at the last category that we have, the Gamecube distributions. These are the Pokemon you could get from the bonus disc from Pokemon Colosseum, X from Pokemon Box or Jiraji from Pokemon Channel. Not everyone has these bonus discs, so it's nice to recreate them as well. There are two major things different from these Pokemon. Firstly the RNG formula for the Gamecube Pokemon is a little bit different, so we had to change it with the correct values. The other thing about these Pokemon is that they have a 32 bit seed instead of a 16 bit one like the others. To recreate this we took the original seed it normally generates and combined it with a random checksum from the save file. Like this we were able to recreate all the Gamecube distributions, except for Jiraji from Pokemon Channel. This one was generated completely different using a total of 12 RNG calls and only a limited amount of seeds that were possible for it. We didn't implement the limited seeding yet because I wanted to do a bit more research on the Gamecube side of things. So this might get a little update in the future. We have now gone through all three categories that we mentioned at the beginning of the video. But as you remember there are still a few that we haven't discussed yet. Let's start with the first one on the list, Mystery Mew. Mystery Mew was not distributed through a multiboot, but instead there were lots of Mew generated on a fire red cartridge and were then traded to people who would come to the event. An original cartridge was preserved and that's how they figured out how these Mews were generated. They were generated into the party in batches of 5 and were then placed into the box until the game was completely filled up with Mews. But that brings us to a problem. There are 426 slots in the games and if they were generated in batch of 5, that means that 4 of them were released in order to fit up the entire game with Muse. So now the question is, is it possible for us to find these 4 deserters and include them in our own distribution? Well let's take a look at how the batch of 5 are generated. Every batch of 5 has an origin seed, which is a 16 bit number. From this origin seed were then 5 Muse sequentially generated. In total there were 85 origin seeds preserved, and with those we can generate all the Muse except for one. So if we now find the origin seed for this Mew, then we can recreate the other 4 as well. To do this I went through all 65,536 possible origin seeds and found that only one origin seed is possible to generate this last Mew, and that is seed 6065 in hexadecimal. This last Mew would have been the third in the batch, and now we've also found the other 4 that were part of it as well. These 4 were never possible to be obtained, because they were released from the game. But we're still adding them into our multi-boot event, preserving all 430 Mews that were generated for this event. Next up are the events that were held at the Pokemon Center in New York. These Pokemon were distributed from the Gotta Catch Em All stations that were available there. And in total there were 12 different distributions from them. Luckily one of these stations was acquired by someone in the event community, and lots of these Pokemon were recreated and put into saves that can be downloaded. In the future it will be fun to recreate the device and make copies that are close to the original, but for now we will recreate the events to the best of our abilities with our Aura Mew multiboot. Let's first talk about the generation method of these Pokemon. It is a little different from all the other distributions and that is done to prevent shiny Pokemon. Another thing was that the trainer ID was incremented by each distribution that was made by the device, 
So the first Pokemon distributed from the campaign would have Trainer ID 1, and the next one would have 2, and it keeps going like that. It is technically possible to implement this too, but for now we decided to randomize this instead. Well, excuse me! Are you saying we're doing something unfaithful to the original event? We promised our viewers faithful recreations and we will not settle for anything less. Alright, alright, let's do this as well. First of all, we would need a counter of how many distributions have been made so far. Luckily for us, there's one right here on the screen. Next up, we would need to give this value to the multiboot before it is transferred to the game. The way we did this was to copy the entire multiboot to our internal memory so we can make modifications to it. We then inserted our value right before the compressed distribution. And in the distribution itself, we now simply read from this address to get the correct trainer ID. And with that, we now have an incrementing trainer ID with each distribution. Lastly, we have to distribute each Pokemon from a campaign from one multiboot. So to do this, we added extra randomization to select a Pokemon from each campaign. And for the sprite, we decided to use a question mark, because it will be a surprise which one you will get. The last one on the English list is the Trade and Battle Day event, also known as Jeremy. Now, Jeremy is a bit of a weird event. In both Fire Red and Leaf Green, a combined total of 12 Pokemon were caught in the wild. These were then cloned and distributed to the players that came to the event. All of these Pokemon have been preserved except for Sandshrew, Slowpoke and Shelter. We decided to do some digging and find some information about these last few Pokemon. And we did find what are supposed to be the IVs, level and personality value of these last three missing Pokemon. But unfortunately not everything matches up. Now the good news is, is that these Pokemon are technically possible to be generated like this. But only if the person who caught these used the Pokemon with the ability synchronized in front. The thing that's odd about that is that these three were the only ones that were caught like that. Another thing is that the preserved slowpoke has the wrong ability. If it was generated in this setting, then it should have the ability own tempo, instead of oblivious. So in short, I need wow. your help. We want to find more samples of these Jeremy Pokemon. If any of you have these Pokemon, even if you sent them all the way to Pokemon Home, then please contact us either through leaving a comment on the video or joining our Discord. We would love to preserve all these Pokemon and make sure they are exactly like the original. For now we will include the ones that we found online in our distribution, but if we find better samples in the future, then we will update them. Now it's time for the last event for today, the Huddle Titans. They were distributed in Japan during the screenings of Lucario and the Mystery of Mew. A few samples were found and preserved, but there's still one thing that is unknown about it. With all the other distributions so far, there have been three different randomizations for the gender of the original trainer but none of these formulas fit for these preserved samples. Now there are two options here I think. Option 1 is that the trainer ID wasn't decided randomly, but instead it copies the gender from your save file. The second option is that some of these preserved samples are fake, and that's why some of them don't fit into any of the known randomizations. And we have secret option number 3, and that is an entirely new randomization used for these Pokemon. I decided to look into secret option number 3, and I made some code that will cycle through all the bit shift and divisions possible and found one solution that fits all samples. A division by 3264 or CC0 in hexadecimal and then the first bit of that result matches the gender of the original trainer for all the samples. Now I do have to say that it seems unlikely to me that they use this randomization for a distribution. But nobody can prove me wrong. Except for Welcome you. Back. If you happen to have one of these titans or know someone that might have one, then please contact us and let's work together to preserve the generation method for these Pokemon. And with that we have recreated all the distributions to the best of our ability. It was so much fun to modify the Aura distribution ROM and make custom code for it to recreate all these Pokemon. I want to thank the people that are named on screen for helping us along the way. And to once again thank my friend on that reality. You've worked really hard to test all the distributions and made sure that the Pokemon are as close to the original as possible. We've been working on this project for many, many months and it feels amazing to finally have finished it. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.